we have been talking about unit testing and I want to switch gears. I want to talk about integration testing, uh, end to end testing, testing the entire program as opposed to little pieces of it. And it's not either or it's and so we did all the unit tests. The unit tests are amazing. And now I want to do integration tests to make sure that if I put all of those individual pieces together, that they work because where software breaks is at the connections between different systems. Things break at the interfaces, things break at the edge. So we need to put all of the pieces together, integrate it and make sure that everything runs. So I wanna show you a, a couple techniques to do this. So let me just remind you of what we're, what we're testing, what we're building. So our program looks like this. If I say node index um, and I, I pass it a HTTPS google.ca, it'll download a URL and it'll pretty print that URL. If I do the same thing with some test data, uh, sample.html, it will read the file and print it out. And I can also, I can pass it various arguments. Like I can say, use an indent of eight and use a width of um, 80 characters. And it will, it will adjust how this thing looks. If I change this to 40, it looks like that. So I need to find a way to be able to test that calling my program like this works. And so I wanna show you some techniques for doing this. Okay, so if you'll recall, our the main part of our program looked like this. Basically, we, we, we process a bunch of arguments and then we, we call into our main function, which calls this process URI function right here. And from process URI down, we've done a pretty good job of testing things. But we haven't tested any of this stuff here. We haven't tested all this code yet. So we need a way to do this. Now, the kind of testing that I'm gonna do with you right now is often referred to as end-to-end -end testing or, you know, so end-to-end, -end, you'll see people write E to E or integration, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing. There's lots of different names for this. But the idea is I wanna take the system as it exists, the whole system, and I wanna test the whole system to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. Okay. So I have a number of problems that I have to solve in order for this to work. The first problem that I have to solve is I need a way to run my program from the command line inside of another program. And so there's lots of ways you can achieve this. Node has a, a thing called child process that lets you do it, but there's a nice uh, node module that I'm gonna use and it's gonna allow me to pass in the name of a a script, a node script, and then pass in a list of arguments and it's gonna pass back to me an object and the object that I get back is going to have a bunch of data on it. So it, I'm gonna get back an object that has things like what was the exit code and I'm also gonna get back strings for standard error and standard out. So it's gonna be possible for me to check to see what this program produced, what the output of the program was, and do that inside of a test rather than you know having to run it and look at it on the screen. So that's, gonna, that's interesting. So I have a way to run my test. Another problem that I'm gonna have is I need to, I need to be able to serve up files and work with things on the file system. Now, in the previous discussion, we talked about using mocks. So we were, we were mocking network requests and we were mocking the file system. But for what I'm about to do here, I actually wanna try using real things uh, because I wanna test this in a more realistic way. So I'm, 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 not gonna, I'm not gonna use mocks as it were. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna create, I'm gonna create a web server and this web server, I'm gonna use it to serve up my test folder. So essentially, you know, if you've worked with Express before, I'm just creating a, a small little web server and this little web server, I, I'm gonna expose two methods, a start method and a stop method. So I can start this thing on a particular port and I can stop it. 
and it's going to serve up the um, well let me show you how it would run if I go into um, if I were to say um, start and stop I'm gonna pull these in from uh, test server like so so I'm gonna say start on port 5000 like this so now if I go to uh, here and I go to localhost 5000 um, localhost 5000 sample.html I get back this page so it what it's doing is it's serving this HTML page right here this sample web page is being served on port 5000 so I have this I have a way to start a server and stop it if I were to go over here and I were to say stop it stops the server and if I were to go and request this page again I get unable to connect there's no web server there so for purposes of doing my testing I'm going to be able to I'm going to be able to start up a real server so that I can request real pages from a web server, download them, process them, and then see how they work. So I have to be able to simulate running my program. That's what the run function is going to do here. So run is going to allow me to call my program, get back the exit code and the outputs of um, the standard out and standard error. I have a web server which I'm gonna to use to uh, be able to request pages from the network, only it's gonna be localhost, so it's always gonna work. I'm not gonna have an issue of it failing when it tries to um, go over the network. I have sample data, so I have like a web page that I've created, which I can use to do my formatting. So this is all great. Now, the last step of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use something called snapshot testing. So the idea of snapshot testing is it's it's really commonly used in um, UI, like programs where you're testing UI. So essentially what you wanna do is you have a program that produces some output and you want to produce the output, you wanna capture the output into a file, like make a snapshot of it. And then in the future, what you wanna do is you want to, um, compare against that snapshot. So I've got a bunch of snapshots and tests here already. Let me show you my tests. So the first test that I'm gonna write, first of all, I'm pulling in run, I'm pulling in my server, and you can see that before all of my tests start, I spin up the web server, and after all of my tests stop, I stop the web server. So this is what's controlling my web server. The web server is gonna live on localhost 3333. So my very first test says, uh, it should print an error message and the help message when you don't give it any arguments. So in other, in other words, I wanna do this. I want to call my I want to call my script without any arguments. And you can see that I got an error message here. Not enough arguments, got zero, needed at least one. But it also prints out this help message here. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, just to show you what's going on, I'm going to comment out all of the rest of these tests. And I'm going to, I'm going to delete all this. And I'll show you what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna run my end-to-end -end test. I'm gonna say npm test end-to-end. -end. What's gonna happen here is the very first time that it runs, it's going to run this test. So it's gonna run my program. It's gonna get back standard error, standard out, and the exit code. It's gonna expect that the exit code is one. In other words, that the program failed. It's going to expect standard error to match a snapshot. So this is what I'm going to show you right now. And it's also going to expect that standard out has nothing on it. So all of this should go to standard error because it's an error message. So I'm going to run this and watch what happens in this file when I do it. Oh, 
Okay, so what's happened here is it has written a snapshot. So it's integration prints an error and help message when there's no argument given. So that's this one right here. So it's running this test right here. And because I said I want it to match a snapshot, what it's gonna do, the very first time it runs is it captures a snapshot. So this is a snapshot of what the program produced. It saves it to a file inside underscore underscore snapshot. So I have this dot snap file. And now if I run that test again, it doesn't have to generate the snapshot. You'll notice that up here it said snapshot summary, one snapshot written, but down here it didn't write any snapshots. All it did was it compared it against this. So this is a really great way of doing testing because once I look at this, <clears throat> I can look at this and I can say, yeah, this is correct. This is how I want it to look. Now, if for some reason it changes, somebody introduces new code and the code looks different, this is gonna break because the, the snapshot that was created before and the live version of what's being produced now aren't gonna match. So that's gonna be a problem and the system is gonna report that back to me and say, okay, well, this didn't actually work. So uh, there's, there's something has changed. What we're doing here, you can use this for all kinds of things. Like this could be a React component. So that's a common way that React stuff gets done or it could be any kind of HTML or formatted data, or anytime you're producing some kind of output, you wanna capture that output, and instead of writing a really complicated test where you say this character has to equal this character, you just say, take this chunk and compare it to this chunk. Take this snapshot and compare it to the, the live result of what I'm doing. Okay, so let's go back to these tests and see what else is in here. So these tests, they all do something pretty similar. So the next test says, if I pass in dash dash help, if I say help, it should not give me an error message. So the exit code should be zero because there's no error. And standard out should be equal to this and standard error should be equal to nothing. So again, if I run this, I'm gonna save uh, let's comment out the rest. If I save this, you'll see another snapshot is gonna get added. Okay, so now I've got a second snapshot for the case where we're doing the help message. And so slowly what's gonna happen is I'm just gonna build up more and more of these snapshots. And so you're recording the way your program should work. So it should, um, properly format the output for a file name. Let's take a look at this one. So this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it a real file, test sample.html, and I'm gonna ex expect that this file gets formatted correctly. So let's try it again. I'll go here. So you'll see that what my snapshot looks like now is it's got it's got the file, like the actual HTML file that was printed out if I were to do that. It's the same output if I were to say node index.js test sample.html. If I did that, this is what I get. So this is a really fantastic system, this idea of snapshotting where I'm writing a test where it just captures the output. I just look at it and say, yeah, it's correct. Like I know it's correct because I've evaluated it. So what you do with these snapshots is you check the snapshots into your into Git along with your tests and your code. And so you have this third thing, you have your code, you have a test, and now you have like a reference that says this is how it should look. Every time you look at this, it should, it should look exactly like this. So we have lots and lots of these tests. What if I do two files? You know, what if I, what if I instead of just giving one file, I give you two files? Well, it should print both of those files. And what if I give a, uh, a URL like localhost 333 sample.html? What if I give a URL and a file? What if I change the width? What if I change the indent? On and on and on it goes all the way down. So let's run the rest of these so that it can write out all of the uh, snapshots. 
So you'll see that now I have a whole file full of snapshots and each one of these snapshots is for a slightly different test. Like for example, when the width is narrower, you can see that the, that the file that it produces is narrower. So this is, this is really great. So I have, a, I have a simple way to know that not only do my unit tests work, so let's just convince ourselves of this. I'm gonna run all of my tests here, NPM test. It's going to run every one of my unit tests in the lib folder. And it's also going to run all of the integration tests, these end-to-end -end tests. So every time that I want to make a change to this code, I'm going to know right away whether I've broken something. So let me, uh, let me just, let's, let's break something. So let's say that, um, Let's say that somebody uh, accidentally gets rid of this. They say, you know what, um, I'm gonna change this. And so now we come along here and we say npm test. And so that represents a major problem. <laughs> this is a problem because we shouldn't be passing tests if, um, oh, you know what? I didn't save the file. It is a problem. It's a problem with the operator of the computer. Okay, so you can see we failed this test. So it says, if we pass in something other than HTTPS or HTTP, then this breaks. And so that's a problem. So, or what else, what else might we change? So let's save this. What if, we access, what if we made a change to the way that Prettier works? What if we change the default to 100 instead of 80? Let's run our tests again and see what would happen. So you can see that we're failing a whole bunch of tests where we expected to get 80, but instead we're getting 100 right? All of these tests are failing. And um, if I change it back to 80 and rerun the tests, everything passes. So the idea of these tests is that I now know if I start messing around with things, if I start making changes, or if I start adding features or removing features, I have a bit of confidence to know, okay, I have dealt with most cases. Now, I wanna talk to you about something else we need to do, and that is we need to check and see how well we've done at covering everything that we have to do. So let me talk to you about this idea of coverage, code coverage. Um, I have a script inside of my package.json for collecting code coverage information. And this is something that you'll be able to do with all testing frameworks. And it's a really, really powerful feature. I wanna demonstrate what it, how it works, what it looks like. So uh, let's take the Node project, for example. Node is humongous. It's an absolute monster of a program. And these are the tests for Node. Like, just all kinds of directories full of uh, tests. Like if I go into parallel, it says like this is, <laughs> sorry, we had to truncate this directory to a thousand files because there's too many files to print. So they have more files, like just in this one directory, test files, than uh, GitHub will allow you to display on the screen at one time. Node has a tremendous number of tests. So here's the question, does Node have enough tests it's a really difficult one to ask unless you have a tool that tells you the answer. So one of the tools that we can use is we can use this code coverage tool. And what code coverage does is it tells you that for Node, for example, for the JavaScript in Node, that 96.66% of all statements are being covered. 94% uh, of all branches are being covered. So for example, you can see that libDNS is at 100%, libfs is at 100%. So if we take a look at libfs, for example, promises.js, oh, this is a simple file, let's find something bigger. libdns, 
No, this is why they're passing. I need something bigger. Uh, let's say HTTP common.js. Okay, here's an example of a file. So this file, as I scroll down, you'll see that beside every line, there's a number. So this line here says 12x. This line here says 410x. This line says 57x. This says uh, 16,042x. And what that means is how many times was this line hit during the tests? So this line here was hit 16,000 times, like a lot of times. And other lines don't get hit that often at all. So like this line here only got hit three times. So if you look at this, you can see that 14,992 times the code made it to this if. However, only three times did it go inside the if. So when you're talking about code coverage, you're trying to figure out for all of the paths that go through a function. And if you take a look at this function right here, this function is pretty good. Like you come into the function and there is a, a path that goes here. So you could go in here. And if you go in here, then you could go in here. So you're starting to branch. These are all the branches through the code. Now, if we go back, uh, let's go back up a level. Let me show you something that isn't. So if I go to lib internal, lib internal is at 95%. Let's see what's going on. Um, lib internal. So if you look at something like encoding or down here, net.js, but let's look at encoding. Encoding is 85% covered. So if I look at encoding, you can see that most of these lines are at 36. This is at 292, 5,080, et cetera. But as we scroll down, you'll see that it'll color code certain things. Um, like for example, this function here never gets tested ever. So this is a, like, that's a lot of code. All of that code, there are zero tests for it. So let's see where this code is being called. So this is make um, text decoder. Well, here it is right here. So look at this. So inside the text decoder, there, they say text decoder is either equal to this implementation or this implementation. So depending on whether internal binding config has international is true or false, they pick one or the other of the two uh, implementations. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to, um, like if you wanted to add a test that covered this, what you would have to do is you'd have to find a way to make this false inside of the test. So that, I don't know how this config works, whether that's environment variables or what it is, build system things, I'm not sure, we'd have to check. But we need a way for it to use the, the make text decoder JS function so that all of this can get tested. And then once this gets tested, you have to test all the different pieces of this. So that would be a way that you could help the node project. Like if you wanted to go and help node, you could go like, let's look at net. Net is only 75% covered. You can see here, for example, make sync write is never tested. So like somebody needs to find a way to get this code to execute so that the, a test could be made in order to do this. Now we can do the exact same thing for our code that we've been writing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say npm run coverage. That's going to run jest and it's going to collect coverage information. So what it does is it prints out this report. It actually does two things. It's it creates a, a coverage. Um, it creates a coverage. Well, let me show you. I'll open this up. If I um, open uh, what is it coverage. LCOV report uh, index.html. So this is the exact same thing we just saw for Node, but it's been generated for our code. If we look at lib, you can see that lib is 97% covered. If I click on lib, file is 100%, pretty printer is 100%, URL is 100%, but we're missing one of the branches in resource.js. So if we click on this, 
you can see here that we don't ever hit this line of code right here, line 15. And you can see the same thing is being said over here. So resource.js, we're hitting 93% of all statements, 66% of branches, but we are missing line 15 inside of resource. Let's, so let's have a look. We aren't hitting this line right here. So this is interesting because it means, if you'll remember, we decided not to expose this function. We don't expose the read function. We only expose the process URI function. So if I want to write a test that's going to hit this, think about how, what we have to do to make that possible. We have to pass in a URI from here to here, and then read is going to get it. So it has to be an invalid file path and an invalid URL path in order to get here. So let's see if we can let's see if we can figure this out. So if I were to write, let's write another test inside resource test. And um, let's let's copy this. So I'm going to say passing an invalid um, URI should throw. Um, so this is not an invalid URI. This is like um, a non-existing file path. OK, so if I pass in an invalid URI, it should um, it should throw it should throw in read so let's think about this i'm going to pass in null for the uri and it's going to give me back some kind of an error message um, let's just run this and see how it goes cuz i don't know what the error message will be so i'm going to say npm test resource Okay, so this fails, but it's pretty close. So you can see that I said that it was going to get this error message right here, but it actually got this error message right here, invalid URI. So I'm just going to copy this error message, and I'm going to fix the one that I have so that it's the correct one. And I'm going to rerun this. Okay, everything passes. Let's try all the tests. And let's look at our coverage report. OK, that's good. So now fifth, line 15 has been covered. It says line 22 is not being covered. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So let's go look at our, if I refresh this, you can see that this is now being hit one time. So we've improved things because we have one time we're going in there. So the only other thing we don't have is I don't have any test that is saying if, if this thing returns no data, then what is it supposed to do? And that's an interesting case. Like I'm not even sure why I do this. In fact, I'm going to get rid of it. And let's run the tests again, make sure that it works. And let's um, do the coverage report again. Perfect. So this is looking really good. It says I'm not. I'm not doing, I'm not covering line 14 inside of here. And to be honest, I'm not going to write a test for my test server. So you get into a situation where, um, you know, it, 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 it's not going to make sense. It's not going to make sense for you to start writing tests for your tests. And then do you write tests for those tests? Like, 
eventually it's you know it, it it's ridiculous but this is pretty good i have i have a, a fair amount of confidence here that i've been able to um you know exercise most of my code uh especially in the lib folder which is really what i care about that i'm i'm going through all of these different code paths to make sure do i have any bugs for sure i have bugs um what happens if um, what, what happens if I try and do this on something that's like, um, an image, like this is an image here. Uh, let's find an image. View image. Like what if I do it on this URL right here? Let's see what it would do. Uh, node index. Um, Actually, that's fascinating. So it didn't crash at least. <laughs> like it prints out uh, it prints out something, but I'm I'm sure I could find something here that would crash in some interesting way because I've just never thought to do it. I've only been testing this on HTML files, for example. What if I start testing it on other types of files? What's it going to do? So, we've we've set ourselves up. We have all of these tests, and the last piece of the puzzle here that we need to um we need to focus on is we need to be able to run these tests in GitHub or inside of a server so that every time we make changes to our code, we can do that. So I'm gonna do that in the last video.